Well, good morning, Central Baptist Church, and especially to those of you joining us online. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. And uh, here's the thing about this morning. It's a beautiful morning because we have people in our church this morning, and it's such an amazing thing, isn't it? So I would love to begin this morning's service with some celebration. And there's many things that we need to celebrate today. We want to celebrate, first of all, just being back together. It's an amazing thing after 18 months of so much separation from each other that we can actually come together and worship Jesus together. It's such a beautiful privilege that we have. And we're so glad that you've joined us, even if you join us online. We long for the day when you also will be able to come and join with us here in this room. God's been faithful in so many ways through this season of COVID. Uh, God's been faithful to Central Baptist Church. We have had two online members, new members classes during COVID, so we look forward to welcoming new people to our community as life goes on. Life has carried on for each one of us. Babies have been born. Uh, some people are pregnant and expecting babies, and it's just so amazing to, to celebrate life together again as we come together. Some people have had milestones in their lives. Uh, we have one couple by the name of Marguerite and Bill Bergman who will celebrate either today or one of these days close by 70th wedding anniversary. That's 7-0. <laughs> so Bill and Marguerite, God bless you and congratulations. At the other end of the scale, we have a couple who are celebrating the 10th day of their marriage. John and Sharon Noel, where are you? John and Sharon were married on July 1st. This is their first time back to Central as a married couple. God bless you. So good to have you with us today. I'm also aware, we are all very aware, that during this time of COVID, a number of our members have been promoted to glory. We've lost a few key, key members of Central Baptist in these last uh, months. And so I think it's very important for us also to take a short time to, to remember and to pay respects to those who have gone, and particularly to remember those family members who are close and who are suffering uh, the pain of grief and separation in this time. So let me invite us just to take a short moment of quiet to pay our respects to those who have been taken from us. We, we don't grieve without hope, we grieve with hope because what we realize is that those people are experiencing the fullness of life with Jesus, right? So we celebrate that. But we also come alongside those family members who are uh, feeling the pain of loss at this time. So let's take a moment just in your own hearts to pray quietly for these families and then I'll say a short prayer after that. We give you praise, O oh Lord, because you are, the, you are the creator of life. And we come to you today with sadness in our hearts as we remember those who have been taken from us. And yet we come with a sense of celebration knowing that they are with you and they are experiencing life beyond what we can imagine. And we pray specifically for those who have lost loved ones. We ask for your grace to be upon them today. Be their comfort, be their guide, be their companion, and let us as a church love those people well. We're so excited to be here today. We pray that you will help us to serve you and worship you with hearts full of joy. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we have the privilege to continue our teaching series, which we're calling Encounter. The teaching series, this whole series, is rooted in the profound and foundational truth of Scripture that the eternal God of the universe invites us not just to know about Him, but to know Him, to have relationship with Him, to encounter Him day by day in our lives. And so to prepare for today's lesson, I want to do a responsive reading for those of you online, please join as you can. For those in the room, let me invite you to stand together as we read these words. I will read the words at the top that say reader, and you can join in reading where it says all. And let's read with 
feeling, right? So let's just not read words, but let's just read this as the word of God. So read with all your heart. This call to worship comes from an amazing chapter in the early part of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 12. It goes like this. Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Let's join together in singing. Good morning, Central. It's so good to see faces again today. Why don't you join us in singing today? See you 
is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. the world. 
Thank you for today, God. Thank you for all these faces here, all these voices here, all these hearts here, God. We thank you that after so long, we're able to come together and worship together as one, God. We lift up today, God. We lift up every day moving forward, God. We lift up our hands. We lift up our hearts. God, there is joy in this house today, God. I pray, Lord, that the words spoken today would touch hearts would change lives. And I pray, Lord, that your people in this room, in this city, across the world, whoever's watching, whoever's hearing this, God, we pray that they would encounter you, God. They would come to know what it is to have a relationship with you, God. What it is to feel the joy that we feel every day. So we love you, Lord. And we lift this up to you, God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. God is good, isn't he? God is so good to us. We're so glad that you're here today. I have just a few announcements to run through at this point in our service. Once again, just a welcome to those of you joining us online and those of you who are right here in our auditorium. We're so glad to see you. The best way to connect with us is on our website. There's a connect card there. You can uh, find that connect card and uh, you can sign up there for anything just to let us know who you are, to ask any questions, to express an interest in a community group, small group, uh, express a prayer request. You can do anything through that connect card. There's also some actual physical connect cards in the foyer. If you have an old fashioned pen, you can actually do that too. And uh, you're welcome to connect with us in any of those ways. We're very excited that this summer restrictions have lifted in time, that our urban adventures will go, for, go forward in person. Uh, the uh, camp is now full, and uh, so we want to ask for your prayers for the Urban Adventures uh, Camp July 19th to the 24th. Uh, there's still a few items that we need, so we put out a list. It's on our website of some food items that we would really like donated to help with the camp. If you can help with purchasing some food items, please go to our website, or if you have any questions, you can call the church office. Uh, there's also a need for some people on the Saturday of the camp, the final day of the camp. They have a scavenger hunt around town and different couples are hidden around town. The kids have to go find them. If you'd like to be one of those hidden couples, just go talk to Tom Drinkwater. He will probably give you a, a good uh, you know, uniform to wear or something like that. But if you'd like to help out with that uh, part of Urban Adventures, please contact the church office or Tom Drinkwater directly. Also, we're excited as we look towards September especially, we want to do a strong kickoff of our community groups. And if our desire is to see everyone in this large church connected in smaller groups with each other in, in uh, weekly or bi-weekly gatherings, at this point what I'm looking for especially is uh, people who might be willing to host a community group 
or lead a community group. And if you fit into one of those categories, I did hear from a couple of you this week. I'd love to hear from more of you. If you're willing to host or lead a new community group, I would love to have conversation with you so that as we come towards September, we can have the possibility to include everybody uh, in a smaller group setting as much as we can. Thank you for your continued giving to Central Baptist Church. The e-transfer is the most effective, cost-effective way for giving, and other options are mailing a check off in the church office or using the Tithely app or simply going to our website. We do have a special video this morning from Camp Kuwanos. Uh, normally what we would do, as I understand, is to have the staff here and have a commissioning service for the staff. That wasn't possible because of the COVID restrictions. But Camp Kuwanos is going full speed ahead this year. They've had a great week this week. This video just gives us a little bit of a picture of what's going on at Camp Kuwanos. And uh, so let's watch this video and then we'll have a short prayer uh, after that video is over. My name is Scott Bailey and I'm here at Quanos with a bunch of our summer staff. We're nearing the end of a week of staff training. Our first camp starts July 4th. This summer is going to be an amazing adventure. In case you've not heard, overnight camps are now allowed again. We're going to run overnight camps at the same time as we do day camps, Mainland Express, and our new kayak adventure camps called SeaQuest. All while we follow the COVID-19 guidelines for summer camps. Thousands have already signed up. The response has been overwhelming, especially after we announced that overnight camps were back. Our theme is full speed ahead. God is calling each of us to follow him and our passion, everyone's here's passion, is to help children and youth discover this for themselves and then step into life with Jesus at the center. As we know in our world, it offers many ways to go, but Jesus says, I am the way. And we, all of us here, are hoping to impact the lives of many kids, many thousands, who will come from your area. And we could not do this without you. We need your prayers for protection and safety, for wisdom and strength, for energy and patience. Please ask God to fill every camp with those who most need to be here. Hey guys, I'm Julia and I'm from Ontario and I'm the head ski instructor this summer. Hey, I'm Abigail, I come from South Africa, and I'll be the staffing coordinator this summer. Hi, I'm Larissa, I'm from 100 Mile House, and I'll be Club Coco host this summer. Hey guys, my name is Luke, I'm from Camrose, Alberta, and I'm the Sequest leader this summer. Hey, I'm Kimberly, I'm from Chilliwack, and I am counseling and helping out in activities. Hey, my name is Isaac, I'm the male head counselor this summer, and I'm from Nanaimo, BC. Hey, I'm Jono, I'm from Newcastle, Australia, and I'm on the events team this summer. My name's Ben Laird, I'm from Ladner, BC, and I'm going to be the Youth Leadership Program's coordinator this summer. Please also pray for all our campers, that God would work in a powerful way in their lives, and that they would experience His love. To help you pray for our campers, we've written out all their names. There are thousands of names here. Your prayers will make all the difference for our campers, for our staff team. It is so encouraging to us that you are lifting us up in prayer. I want to thank you. I can't wait to see what God is going to do here this summer. I was speaking with Tristan at Camp Kiwanis this past week, and uh, he made me aware of one other need that they have. So they had all these buses organized to take kids back and forth each day to the day camps when overnight camps were not allowed. Now they ha well, overnight camps are allowed. Most of the campers have gone to overnight, but there's still a few that need to go back and forth to camp every day, several weeks through the summer. So if you could commit a week and you'd like a drive up to beautiful Camp Kuanos and back, uh, all of the details are here. You can go, you can stay in the guest cabin up there for the day, you can help out with the camp and then bring the kids back at the end of the day. But if you have an interest in perhaps serving Camp Kuanos through driving kids up there and back each day during one week, uh, you can contact me at the office. I have all of the details to help you with that. Please join me in our prayer this morning. Eternal God, our loving Heavenly Father, we come humbly and yet boldly into your presence this morning. 
We give you thanks and praise for the good work of the staff and volunteers at Camp Kuanos. Thank you for the opportunity that's opened up for overnight camps this summer. And Lord, we ask for your good work to be done at camp this summer. Even as we in this place study and learn about encountering you in our day-to-day lives, I pray that many children this year, this summer, would encounter you, that they would make life-changing decisions at camp this summer. Would you give the counselors and teachers, directors and staff much wisdom and discernment? Let them live the life of faith authentically before the children and let them speak words of truth and grace that would be faithful to your holy word and that would be helpful in pointing the children's attention to the beauty of Jesus. Lord, we're so excited that so many of us can actually join together in person this morning. We ask that by your grace, we might be able from this point on to steadily emerge from the COVID restrictions that have separated us from one another for so many months. And as we do this, may we learn again how to be a community of people who love you with our whole hearts and who truly also love one another. Even as we celebrate our coming together this morning, we also intercede for other places in the world where disease is still out of control And we ask for your mercy and grace to be on the people who live and work in those places. We are especially grateful for the children of our community who are back with us today. And we pray that as they are dismissed to their classes that you will be their teacher, that they will come to know and love you from their earliest days. And for the rest of us, we ask that you will open our hearts to hear your word and to respond to your word as it is read and taught to us. In the name of Jesus, we ask all of these things. Amen. Amen. It's time now for all of you watching online, kids watching online, there is a video for you to go to, a Right Now Media video, which you can find on our church website or in the email that you received this week. And for kids who are here in our church this morning, kids up to grade seven, uh, we are delighted to have an opportunity for classes for you, and this is a time for you to go. Look for the people in the purple shirts back there. They will guide you if you're not sure where to go. And uh, we're so glad that you're here with us today. God bless you as you go and enjoy your, your time together. This time it's my pleasure to uh, invite Marianne Crow, and she's going to come and read the scripture to us this morning. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. Please turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 12, or follow along in the insert or the handout that we received at the beginning or on your phone or wherever you follow the Bible. Um, please stand for the reading of God's word. I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go to the visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether in body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. And on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weakness. Though, if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited, Three times I have pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And I would ask you to turn your attention to the screen for a video to prepare us for the sermon. One of my favorite moments this morning was singing in Christ alone and I just stopped singing so I could hear all of you singing. Uh, what a joy that was after so long to be able to hear so many voices lifted up. Just what a refreshment to my heart. Uh, good to be back together and continuing in this series together. Let's just pause for a moment of prayer and pray as we begin uh, to look at God's word this morning. Father, what a privilege it is uh, to come together. We, we are in moments like this reminded what a true privilege it is and what a refreshment it is to our souls. Uh, for Lord, you have made us to worship together, to be together in uh, moments like this. We learn the truth of that all over again. And so Father, I just wanna thank you for that and give you praise that you have restored us and you are continuing to restore us over these summer months. Thank you for this. And Father, what a privilege it is again to look at your word together. So this morning that we pray that the Holy Spirit who inspired these very words of the Apostle Paul, that same Holy Spirit would be granted to us that we might understand it, but more than that, that these words would come home to our hearts, that the message that the Spirit inspired to Paul would come to us and that we would be changed. So come and do this, we pray now in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're doing this series, as you've been hearing, called Encounter, about encountering God. And this morning, what I want to talk about is how we encounter God through what often is referred to as our thorns in the flesh, a reference to the passage that you heard this morning. I'm going to define that a whole lot more as we kind of go along this morning, but thorns in the flesh are things that we're talking about that they're, they're things that handicap us, they cripple us, they, they hinder us, they're things that are kind of always there, not necessarily our fault, but they're always there and they make life difficult. They make it so that we cannot serve Christ as we want to. They can even uh, cause us to feel frustrated and to drain our energy. And so today what I want to do is just look at this incredible passage together where Paul not only enables us to understand the thorns that are in our lives, but he goes beyond that and he shows us how we can even embrace them, how we can even boast in them, and he wants to show us how all this is one of the chief ways that we encounter God. We encounter God through these thorns in the flesh. Bit counterintuitive for us, but I trust that we're gonna see it this morning. So let's not waste any more time. Let's just get right to this this morning. This passage is gonna call us to do four things, to identify the thorns, then we're gonna learn how to understand the thorns, then embrace the thorns, very counterintuitive, and finally, to boast in the thorns. All right, so we get ready to do this together. Yes, okay, I need some response. Now I can get some response. This is good, are we ready, okay? Okay, I'm ready to go if you are. First of all then, here's what we must do. We gotta identify the thorns. That's what this passage calls us to do, to identify them. Now, let's think about the Apostle Paul first of all. When we think of the Apostle Paul, I don't know about you, but he, I think this is a successful man. I mean, he planted how many churches? I don't even know. So many churches you can't even count successfully planted these churches. Not only that, he's such a powerful man in the sense that he endured tremendous persecution and suffering. I mean, he was beaten, he was flogged, he was thrown in prison, he was stoned, all for the sake of serving Jesus. So we think of Paul, you think, man, what a man of strength, what a man of power. In light of all that, you might think that, but that's not actually really the case. When you read this passage and other ones, Paul most certainly did achieve great things. No doubt about it. But he did it all with a crippling handicap. 
When we use that word handicap, we use it in all kinds of different ways. We mean it's something that hinders progress. It's something that makes life difficult. And Paul tells us in this passage here that he had a permanent handicap that was always frustrating him, always causing him grief, making his life difficult, and making it so that he could not serve Christ the, with the fullness of all that he wanted to do. It was constantly holding him back. And he calls this handicap a thorn in the flesh. So a thorn, like a, a, a really big sliver, if you will, a rose thorn, if you will, underneath his skin, that's the metaphor that he cannot get out and it's always causing him grief. Now, Bible scholars are always kind of debating what this thorn was because the Apostle Paul doesn't actually tell us what his thorn was. But kind of reading between the lines, reading some of his other passages of Scripture, uh, Bible scholars kind of give, come up with a few options. So here's a few of them. Some say it was an inner psychological struggle. Some say it was a psychological struggle because, as you might know his story, he used to persecute the church. He had blood on his hands from Christians being killed, and so he was always struggling with his past. Some say it's that. Others say it was still psychological, but it wasn't that. It was what Paul tells us in other passages where he says he daily faces all the pressures and the concerns of the churches. So he, he carries this weight as he tries to really pastor all of these churches. So for this view, it's psychological struggles. Other people say, no, it's not psychological. It's actually people that are the thorn in the flesh. He had people who were always opposing him, both inside the church and outside the church. He was persecuted outside. He was criticized within. And there's no question that was true. And so some say his thorn in the flesh was other people who were always causing him grief. Others say, no, it's not that. It's actually some sort of physical thing, a physical affliction. I mean, he does it call it a thorn in the flesh after all. And so then Bible scholars looking and reading between the lines on some other things think that maybe he had, for instance, poor eyesight, uh, that he struggled with malaria fever, that he had severe migraine headaches, and probably one of those popular ones is that he had a speech impediment. So he's a preacher but he has a speech impediment, which is always frustrating him and, and holding him back. So most commentators probably lean to the last one, that there's some sort of physical thing in his body that was always causing him frustration, always holding him back. I kind of thought a little bit about this in my own life as a small example to kind of drive this point home. Last fall, probably from summer uh, all the way till December, I had to always wear slippers or shoes around the house. I could never walk on any hard surface at all because when I did and I stepped down on my heel, I'd just get this super sharp pain that would just kind of make me jolt. And I would look down and there'd always be a little bit of blood on my heel underneath the skin. So I knew something was in there. I kind of thought it would work its way out like just a small sliver or something like that. It didn't and so finally, uh, I went to the doctor and my doctor made a little incision in my heel and pulled out a really sharp piece of glass. So this little sharp piece of glass was always just jamming up into the nerve in my heel causing me tremendous frustration. And that's really what the image of Paul's thorn is. So we don't, sometimes you might get a thorn in your heel, but maybe as a modern analogy, a sharp piece of glass in the flesh, so to speak. Something that you, for Paul, he could not remove it. I got to remove it, I got relief. Paul got no relief whatsoever. It was always there, crippling his enjoyment of life, draining his energy, and greatly handicapping him from anything that he wanted to do in the cause of Christ. Now, I think it's probably good, actually, that we don't know exactly what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. It's good, I think, because we can apply this pretty broadly to ourselves and to our own situation today. We all have something in our lives. There's some sort of thorn, something that's there. So as I've been praying for you this morning and praying through this message, just praying now that the Spirit would reveal that as we kind of think this through a little bit. So maybe already, can you think to yourself, what is my thorn in the flesh? So to clarify, it's something that's always there in your life. It's most likely something that's not your fault. It doesn't seem like this is something that Paul had done and he was reaping what he sows, so to speak. So it's not your fault probably, but you can't get rid of it. You can't conquer it. And it greatly handicaps what you try to do in life and particularly in serving Christ. 
So for some of you, it might be actually a physical thing like many think it was for Paul. So physical things like severe migraine headaches continually. Uh, Maybe it's chronic pain. Maybe it's a disease like MS or Parkinson's. Maybe it's hearing loss. Maybe it's blindness. All of these could be thorns in the flesh. And anyone who struggles with these kind of matters knows that, for instance, if you have severe back pain, You just cannot do life like you would like to. It's always there, always hindering you. Chronic pain makes it very difficult to think and to process your thoughts and hard to get anything done. So maybe it's something physical for you. Maybe, though, it is a psychological thorn. Mental health struggle. Maybe it's clinical depression. Maybe it's an anxiety disorder or something psychologically that's even harder to bear. For instance, I think of a friend of mine, he struggled a lot with clinical depression, and he said even on the sunniest, nicest days, he felt like there was a dark storm cloud over his entire life. Just could never escape this dark cloud. That's it. It's like a sharp piece of glass in your mind which cannot be removed. Maybe that's your thorn. Or perhaps for other people might be living in a family that's just filled with troubles. It's always one problem, one disaster after another. It never goes away. It's always draining you no matter how much you try to fix things. Or finally, maybe it might even be your personality. A lot of people struggle with their own personality. They want to be social. They want to do things that they see other people doing, but they just struggle in social situations. They struggle with their own personality and things are hard for them or maybe they feel lonely. And for many people, I think they look at their own personality and think this is something I feel like, oh, I'm trying to overcome it, but it's just always causing me grief and frustration in life. So reflect right now, and may the Spirit just lead us in this moment. Can you identify what your thorn in the flesh might be? Again, it's probably not something that's your fault, but it's something you live with all the time. It handicaps you, it can crush your spirit, And it makes it very difficult to serve Christ in the full way that you might like to. So that's the first point. But even as we begin to transition now, when we've identified these thorns, we start to think to ourselves, okay, we believe that God is all-powerful. We believe that God is loving. The question then is, why doesn't God do something about it? I mean, I've got kids. If my kids had pain and I had the ability to remove that pain, I would do that. God is our father. We are his children. God is all-powerful. He could do anything, so why doesn't he then remove the thorns in the flesh since he clearly has the ability to do it? And I'm sure many of us, as we've lived with our thorn in the flesh, have asked that exact question. Well, that leads us directly into the second thing in this passage. First, we've got to identify the thorn. And here is secondly what our passage calls us to do. We must understand the thorns. Understand them. So this is a critical part of the message. And I'm praying for many of you, this might be a real turning point in the way that you view your own thorns in the flesh. So I want you to notice with me in this passage that the Apostle Paul himself, early on, did not know the reasons for his thorns. He he was perplexed about it. In fact, he tells us that his first reaction was to plead with God, to ask God, please take this away from me. Look at verse 8. Three times he says, I pleaded, I begged the Lord about this, that that it should leave me. So just like us, that's our first reaction as well, isn't it? We say, God, in many ways, uh, I can understand you're, you're a good God, you're a powerful God, and we say, but I want you to take this away. I actually think it's a pretty good first reaction. I don't think there's anything wrong with that as a first reaction because there's kind of two types of handicaps that we might face in life, two types of thorns, if you want to put it that way. There are those that cannot be overcome, And there are those that can be, maybe mostly anyways, overcome. So for instance, if your thorn in the flesh is something that can be overcome, then what the scriptures say, as we saw, for instance, in our study of Proverbs, you should work to overcome it. If if you can do it, you should. So for instance, take this issue of loneliness. It's possible that it might not be totally overcome in this life, but if that's something that you struggle with, there are things that can be done. I mean, you you, you don't want to isolate yourself from other people because if you isolate yourself intentionally, it will lead to more loneliness. So you take steps towards people. Even if that's hard, you try to get to know people. Things can be done to help loneliness 
doesn't solve it all entirely, but you don't want to just step back and say, well, this is my thorn in the flesh. There's nothing I can do about it, right? Or if it's financial struggles, I mean, things like a budget, working hard, might not, you might not get rich, but there are things that you can do to alleviate that. So there are some thorns in the flesh that you can remove, that you can overcome, maybe not entirely, but if you can do something about it, you should. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. There are also some thorns, what Paul is talking about, that cannot be removed. That's what Paul is referring to. He says he begged God to take it away from him, but God did not take it away. So Paul might be not, he might not be very clear what his thorn was for us. We don't know what it was. But what does get clear in this passage is he tells us why God did not remove it. This is the key for us because this is what we struggle with too. And when it's not taken away, why God? What possible purpose could there be for me in having this in my life? And Paul, as he goes on in his life, learns the reason. He understands why God would allow this thorn in his flesh. So let's look at verse 7. Here's the reason. He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. So Paul says he was at risk of becoming prideful, self-confident, conceited. Now, why, why was that the case? He tells us right here, doesn't he? He's had greater spiritual experiences than anyone else. I mean, Paul met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. Not many people have got that in history. Paul also here, he's referring to revelations. God had given him visions, or he doesn't even know if it was real, if it was visions. Somehow he'd been lifted up into heaven. He was told things, he was taught things that the average person just doesn't get. So he had spiritual experiences, spiritual knowledge that the average person does not have. And so he says because he was given all this, he was also permitted to have this thorn in the flesh because there was a danger that he would think too highly of himself. He might look down on other people. He would think he is superior. He would become self-confident. And so this thorn in the flesh was given to keep him from all of that. Although it was painful, it saved him from pride, which is the ruin of so many. It reminded him constantly of his need for God's grace. So then we think about ourselves as well. And what we learn from that is that our very best spiritual experiences, our best abilities, can all actually be twisted for wrong purposes. And it's so subtle that we don't often even realize it. For instance, maybe you've studied the Bible a lot and you understand a lot of things. With that knowledge comes a temptation that you start to think you know better than everyone else and maybe that you're superior to everyone else. You'd never say that out loud. But that kind of attitude can start to creep in on something good like studying the Bible. We're so grateful when we look at our lives and we say, okay, God, thank you for the gifts you've given me, the abilities, and maybe you're even just pouring out those gifts and abilities like Paul was for the sake of Jesus. You're using your life for Jesus. But it's very possible that you begin to trust in your own abilities to think, I can do this. I am very gifted. I am very talented. And you can start to begin to rely on yourself. And that's where pride has begun to creep in. Or maybe you're just so grateful to God for all the ways he has met with you and led you over the years. You look back in your life, God has led me in so many ways and so many things have worked out maybe even well for you. And the danger there, of course, is you start to think, I was wise. I did this rightly. And when other people's lives are falling apart, maybe you think, ah, if they'd just been a little more, you'd done this and this, that wouldn't have happened to them. But now you're kind of looking down on them and literally you remember it was the grace of God that led you there. So when we understand this about the thorns, we start to see the thorns in a very different light. Oh, the thorn is negative. Don't get me wrong. Paul's not saying the thorn is a positive thing by nature. The thorn is a negative thing. But what he wants us to understand is that God uses it for positive purposes. Notice he calls it a messenger of Satan. Doesn't get more dramatic than that. <laughs> That's as negative as you can get. A messenger of Satan. But he's saying God takes that evil and he uses it for good. So what is the good? What do we need to understand, Paul? What is this good that, you can, that God will use these thorns in our lives for? What do we need to understand here? And what Paul is saying is what thorns are going to do in our lives is they're going to humble us. 
The good that is going to happen is we're going to feel deep in our being our great need for God because the thorn is going to force that. Without it there, we might not have felt it, but now we feel our great need for God. The good that the thorn brings is when we feel that need. We're on our knees in prayer saying, God, I need you. I need you to help me. I need your strength. I cannot do this on my own. The good that this accomplishes is that it saves us from the worst sin of all, which is pride. Pride is what made the devil into the devil. I don't want to go down that path. And the older I get, the more I watch how pride destroys people. It's so subtle at the beginning. And I say, God, I don't want that pride in my life. And God says, well, that's what the thorn is there for. It's going to keep you humble and dependent, looking to me, continually relying upon me. So the thorn never lets these things happen because it constantly reminds us how weak we are, how needy we are, and how much we need to come back to God. So have you ever understood your thorn like this? What this does for us is it shows us that what felt so purposeless and so painful, if there's no purpose in pain, that's when we fall into despair. But if on our pain we can see there's purpose. Now we can understand something that can lead us forward so we don't lose hope. Again, we're not saying the thorn is a good thing. It might even be a messenger of Satan himself. But God uses it for his purposes. So we identify the thorn and then we begin to understand it. And what we're to understand is that God has a purpose in not removing the thorn, in allowing it to continue, and it's so that it will work true dependence, true humility, true need for God into our lives so that we live rightly before our Creator where so many of us would never do so if we were just allowed to continue on in our own strength and our own way. So we understand something. Once we understand that there can be purpose to our thorns, then we're only ready now to move to the next step. And this is the counterintuitive one. In the third place, this passage calls us to embrace the thorns. Embrace them. Wow, this is counterintuitive, isn't it? When you go back to whatever that thorn was, at first we're like Paul. We're saying, I can't stand this thorn in my life. We're saying, God, please take this thorn away. I can't live with this. This is far too difficult for me, just like Paul. And in that moment, we think God has not answered our prayers because he's not removed the thorn. But when we begin to understand the purpose, like we saw in the last point, now we understand that God actually is answering our prayers, just not in the way we thought. So often we learn this. It seems that when God is saying no to us, he's actually opening a door for a whole new yes. He has something entirely different. Paul was made weak by his thorns, but then he discovered something that caused him to embrace his thorn. He discovered that when he was weak, it was precisely then that he was most ready to receive the power of God in his life. So here's what he writes in verses eight and nine. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that, he sh that it should leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. To shift the metaphor from a thorn to a weight, a weight that would just crush you that never gets removed. Do you ever just feel like that weight is too much? You just think, I, I cannot handle this weight? And you just start to say, it's too much for me, Lord. I don't have the strength to lift this weight. You know that God's answer is always to lighten the load, but not typically in the way we think. Because the way we think of it is, God, to lighten the load that's crushing me, you have to remove it. That's really the only option we can think of. It's either there or it's not there. But even just some of your weightlifters, I can see all of you. I, I mean, I can see you over, over COVID, you have buffed up. You've been in the gym, so imagine you're in the gym. For those of you, if, if you've never been there, just imagine and follow this. Guy, guy or girl on a, a bench press, you know, bench pressing, but the weight is getting too strong. There's a few ways that that weight can be lightened, right? One way is to totally remove it and never go to the gym again. Some of us have taken that option. 
But there's another way, there's two more ways really that, that weight can be lightened. One is if you're ever bench pressing, if you're smart, you always have a spotter. And a spotter is somebody who stands behind the bench and if, they, if the person calls for it, they even just put two fingers under the bar and even just lifting with two fingers, they're not even doing much. Psychologically and stuff, it helps the person on the bench to press up again and to get a bit more strength. That's a little bit what Paul's saying here. God, his grace is sufficient. He's going to give you the ability. He's not going to remove the weight, but he will enable you to lift it. And another thing that God does is he just keeps us in the gym. Because another way that weight gets lighter is if you keep doing it. If you can only bench pass, say, 100 pounds, if you keep doing that regularly, 100 pounds is not quite so heavy anymore after you've been in the gym for a few months. So typically, God does not remove the weight. Typically, he brings in his grace, and he says, I'm gonna enable you to do this. I'll do this with you. You you can do this by my strength. And then long-term, what he's doing is, I'm teaching you more and more faith in me, teaching you more and more strength. I'm gonna give you more and more things in life, and you're gonna have to learn how to trust me as we do this. So that seems to be God's primary way he answers these prayers. At first, we're upset with God. Why didn't you remove it? And then like Paul, we begin to learn, oh, okay, he has a purpose in what, I, what my thorn in the flesh is. He has a reason to do this. And isn't this exactly what he did with his own son while his son was on this earth? Just as Paul prayed three times for his thorn to be removed, Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane prayed three times that his father, if it was possible, would remove the cup from him, the cross that is. And here's what Jesus prayed, or we read in the book of Matthew, that going a little farther, Jesus fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Remove this from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. It's the same for you and I. God did not remove the cup from Jesus' hand. Did not take it away. In one sense, the prayer though was answered because what did God do for Jesus? Well, if you read Luke's account of this, it says that after he prayed this, an angel came to strengthen him. So he was strengthened to lift the cup. God did not remove it. He gave him the grace to walk through it. And it was the same for the Apostle Paul. God did not remove his thorn, but God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And it's the same for us. Perhaps maybe you've prayed a hundred times that God would remove this thing from your life, this thorn that just keeps on being there, that hinders you and handicaps you. But listen, if you've prayed it a hundred times and God has not removed it, it very well may be that his answer to you is the same as it was for Paul. And he's saying to you, my grace is sufficient for you. And what you're gonna learn is that my power is made perfect in your weakness. God is saying to us, I have purposes I want to work out in your life. They can't be accomplished if you're too self-sufficient, if you think too highly of yourself, if you have looking down on other people. I can only work out these purposes when you become like my son, humble, dependent, trusting in your father, no matter what happens. God says, I have purposes and I want to work them out for your good. Have you ever experienced this in your life? I mean, so many Christians testify and say it was in their hardest moments when they encountered God the most powerfully in their life. So many people say that. And so it is with us. He often does not remove the thorns, but he strengthens us in them, and we encounter him in new ways in the midst of the pain of the thorn. This is why Paul, or God says to Paul in the latter half of the verse that his power is made perfect and weakest. Not only is his grace sufficient for you to carry you through this, but also his power is made perfect in your weakness. And when I read that, I'll, I'll just be really honest with you, this is one of my life verses. I quote this almost every time before I come up to preach, regularly before all kinds of things, because when I read this passage, I say to myself, okay, God, so you love to work through weakness? Here I am. <laughs> I'm just a normal guy. 
You've given me some gifts and abilities, but when I, for, for just, I'll just be personal for a moment, when I think of the weight of trying to preach God's word, which to me is just the most overwhelming task in the world, to try and do something like that, I just think I'm so insufficient to do this. Who am I to speak on behalf of God? Who am I to open up the scriptures? And I look at my manuscript and I'm like, oh, this is ridiculous. Why can't I come up with something better than this? So I just go, Weak, hear God, hear God, weak guy, I need your power. And, and same for you, I mean, sure, look at your life. How do you want to serve Christ? You say, Jesus, I want to serve you, I want to do things, but my gifts aren't that great, my personality's not that great, I'm going to do my best, I'll keep walking, but Jesus, I'm claiming this verse right here because you say you like to use weak people? <laughs> here I am, Lord. Use me. May your, may your power be pleased to rest on me. And you, you let the overwhelming weight of the thorn, I'm mixing metaphors now, you let the weight crush you but not crush you to despair, crush you to your knees. And come before him and say, I need you. I need you so much. I cannot do this on my own. I need your strength. And then what you begin to discover is it is precisely in that moment that you encounter God. It's precisely in that moment that God is pleased to use you in ways you just go, I can't even believe he let me do that. That's incredible. Thank you, Lord, that you'd be pleased to use me. And then you quickly go, I don't get credit for this. <laughs> because you know, deep in your heart, you know you did not have the strength. You've learned it so deep in your soul that pride can't get in there because the thorn has been there the whole time, pressing and pressing, so that you're saying to yourself, I don't have the strength. I can only do this by God's strength. You see how that works? Oh, what a glorious promise this is. As I was thinking about all of this, I thought of a very famous moment that kind of captures everything we're talking about, a famous moment in history. It was de uh, depicted in a recent movie called Dunkirk. Maybe some of you have seen this. Uh, if you haven't hear it, heard of it, it's a famous story in history. They refer to it in history as the miracle of Dunkirk. If you've seen the movie, great movie, uh, but they actually left out one of the most critical parts of the entire story, like Hollywood often does. So I'm going to tell it to you. Here's the, here's the story. Here's a map uh, of Europe, 1940, and as you can see, Hitler's forces had taken over almost all of Europe by this time, uh, moving down towards Spain, taking over half of France, and uh, what's going on at this moment is that England had sent 200,000 troops across the English Channel and they come down to fight here. There were about 100,000 French, uh, 140,000 French and Allied troops which were all trying to defend France. But Hitler, in a masterful stroke of uh, military genius, had figured out a way to, to surround all of the Allied armies and was beginning to press them all up here. They're surrounded, and they're all being pressed up to this little tiny town which is here called Dunkirk, just across the English Channel from England. So they're completely surrounded. They're totally being defeated. They're all retreating. So 350,000 troops are retreating up north as they're being pressed in from all around. The plan by the British and by the French was to evacuate the troops back across the English Channel and back to England to save the armies because the entire basic armies left to fight in Europe. But it all just seemed impossible. Here's a picture of the beach of Dunkirk. That's just one angle. So these are just 300,000 troops just standing on a beach. Now, if you know anything about war, you don't know anything about war. That's a bad place to be standing, but it's the only place they got left because they're being pressed up farther and farther and retreating. And so all of these troops are on the beaches. Meanwhile, 1,800 German tanks were moving up uh, towards them. Not only that, German bombers would come in, and what do you call that? That's the definition of sitting ducks, right? Bombers just come down the beach, spray the beach, and you're finished. It was the one of the, <coughs> excuse me, it was one of the darkest hours. The French premier at the time, Paul Renaud, said, quote, we have been defeated. We are beaten. In that moment, it seemed as if the entire English, French, and some allied troops would be completely destroyed. The whole army to fight back against Hitler was going to be destroyed. And of course, if that happens, there is no more war. Hitler takes Europe. Hitler eventually takes England. And who knows where things go after that. Here's the part that got left out of the movie. On May 23rd, 1940, Winston Churchill <clears throat> excuse me, had an audience with King George VI. The king called for a national day of prayer. 
Over the radio, he said these words. Let us with one heart and soul humbly but confidently commit our cause to God and ask his aid that we may valiantly defend the right as it has given us to see it. The right to defend, the right for freedom. This is how we view it. We're asking God, he's calling on the whole nation to call upon God to defend, defend them and let, let things turn around. It was when all hope was lost, literally all hope was lost, that the entire nation began to turn towards God. Can you imagine such a moment? I, I can't fathom that in Canada, but all across the nation, people filled the churches. So here's a newspaper clipping uh, from just outside Westminster Abbey. You, you see it right there. For those of you who've been there in London, thousands of people inside Westminster Abbey, if you've ever been there, very large church, and just thousands of people lined up all the way down, all just getting in, not even to go to a service, just to pray. So for days, English people everywhere just praying to God in this darkest of hours. Then certain events took place which historians to this day do not even really know how to explain. And that's why it's simply referred to as the miracle of Dunkirk. Three things. First of all, during those three days of prayer, Hitler did the absolutely unthinkable from a military strategic point of view. He halted his attack for three days. He had, he had the whole place surrounded. He could have just pressed in, pressed them right into the ocean, destroyed them all, won the entire war. For some reason, and there's a few kind of little historical reasons, but nobody really knows why, he halts the attack, does not complete what he could have completed in that moment. That gave all of the British and Allied troops time to fully retreat to the beaches of Dunkirk to get all 340,000 onto the beaches. Secondly, the 340,000 troops were all just sitting ducks on the beaches, but during those three days, heavy, heavy rains came in. So much cloud, so much rain, the German bombers could not fly, and so they could not really bomb the beaches. And then third, despite the heavy rains, there was no wind. The English Channel is usually a very choppy place, uh, very difficult to, to cross but it was not at that time, and so many boats could come across, and if you know the story, uh, about 850 people's personal fishing boats and uh, pleasure boats all came across, and they ferried all the troops back across the English Channel to England. And so as you probably know then, this becomes one of the turning points of the entire war, because had the army been lost, the war would have been lost. The army was saved in that moment, and then if you know your history, you go a little bit farther, and D-Day happens, where now all the Allied troops go on D-Day and reinvade France, and eventually the war is won. So this is the hinge upon which the war turns. All of that to say, just like our lives, there are forces against us, thorns in our flesh, things we cannot get rid of, things which seem so powerful, so oppressive to us, we cannot escape them. They're just, it's too powerful of something. And so we're pleading with God, just stop it, Lord, remove it, please. But that's not always God's answer. But what that does is it puts us on our knees where we say to God, I'm just too weak. I don't have the strength to do this. I need you. And when we're in that position, like the nation of England was, when we're in the position on our knees crying out to God, now we are perfectly positioned for God to do some miraculous things in our lives. It is then that we encounter God. It is then that God's power gets made perfect in our weakness. The Scottish pastor James Stewart writes this, before any of us can function with maximum efficiency, somehow we have to get We've got to touch rock bottom. To have our souls stripped of every relic of self and self-trust and left absolutely bare and naked. So that it has, it has simply got to be God then or we are done. It is the men and women who out of that despair have flung themselves on Christ for help on whom the energizing spirit of Christ comes like a passion. It is when a soul, beaten and broken down into helplessness, had, has made its utter God surrender that it rises into the power of an endless life. And here's the big final line. And whatever burden or handicap it is that bears you down, presses you down, it is a blessed thing. You can embrace it. It is a blessed thing if it casts you into the arms 
of God. It is a blessed thing if it casts you into the arms of God. That's the only way you could ever embrace a thorn. The thorn that originally you thought, I just want it removed. And then you begin to understand, okay, God has purposes in thorns. And then when you see the purpose, you're like, okay, not only does he have purpose, I want to embrace this thorn because, wow, I want to serve Christ with all my heart. And if, if it's through this that I learn true dependence and true trust, if it's through this that I get his power, oh, I can embrace this now then. When you get that, then you can come even to the last part that Paul learned. In the final place, you begin to boast in your thorns, to boast in them. This is what Paul writes next. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness. You get that? I'm going to boast about how weak I am. Well, why, why would you do that, Paul? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'm not going to promote myself and think I'm all great. No, I'm going to humble myself, and that's when God will be pleased to use me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And is that not the whole message of Christianity? Through weakness, there is strength. That is the message of the cross that what appeared to be the greatest weakness in history where the son of God in human flesh gets murdered by his own creation. If there is ever a moment of weakness, it sure looks like that's a failure. Ah, oh, but it's not. It's the greatest moment of strength. It's the greatest moment of victory. And it's the same for you and I. As we come to Christ and we say, Jesus, I am weak and whatever my thorn is, whatever it's causing me difficulty. Jesus, I need you. Be pleased to strengthen me that however you may please, just use my life for your purposes. And then when you can do that, then you begin to boast in your thorns because you can start saying, look what God did through my weak life. Me, look at me. He actually, look what God did. You're not boasting in yourself because you know in your heart, you're like, this could never have been done without God. So you begin to boast and experience the grace of God. You boast in the thorns because it's God who makes you strong. You boast in the thorns because it's through them that the power of Christ can rest upon you. Let's spend a moment in prayer. Father, that is, that is us when we see clearly when our pride has been crushed, when our great self-confidence has been knocked down, when we're truly seeing life accurately, we all come before you saying we are weak. We are dependent. We are creatures. We are not gods. We're not even close to gods. We are creatures who are sinful, who are weak, and Lord, in that moment, we say to you, we need you desperately. We need you, Jesus, to purify us of all of our sins and make us right with you. We need you then to grant us your spirit to make us strong to do the tasks that you've made us to do. We need your spirit to rest upon us as we go about those tasks, whatever they may be. And so, Jesus, we look back at our lives and we boast of any good thing that has been accomplished through any of us. We give you the glory. We give you the credit for we know we could never have done that on our own. And so, Lord, we embrace the thorn as difficult as it is to have in our lives. We'd wish it gone. But, Lord, if it's your will that it be there as it was for your son, then strengthen us and let it teach us that we might embrace it and even boast in it. So be pleased to do this in each of our lives. Do this through our church. Jesus, we confess that we are weak, even as a church, to try to reach this city, this culture for Christ. We are weak, but we know that you are strong. So be pleased to have your power rest upon us. We ask this in your name. Amen.
is so holy fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raise with him to endless life. holds us, even in our weakness, in our inabilities. He holds us. He carries us. What a glorious Savior. For those of you online, we're glad that you can join us, and when you're comfortable, come on back. I know it's taking some of us some time. We feel it out, but just know you're most welcome to join us when you're ready. For those of you who are here, what a wonderful morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, just so good to be back in person together. And for those of you who are here, if you're looking for another way to give, there will be ushers uh, as you go out. And if somehow you brought cash or something like that and you'd like to give, they'll be holding the, the bags for you as you head out. Uh, no pressure to give, but if you'd like to, you're more than welcome. Let's conclude with these great words from the Apostle Paul, same Apostle Paul we just heard from, who has that thorn in the flesh, but has also learned that God's power is made perfect in weakness. And this is what then happens when his power gets made perfect in weakness. We can say these words, now to him who is able, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.